Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Parvez Harris uh, from De Montfort University in Leicester. And uh, I would like to welcome you all to this event, uh, which is uh, organized on the World Food Safety Day. And uh, so obviously, uh, this presentation is going to focus on food. And the specific food that we are going to discuss today is rice, uh, which is the staple diet of almost half the world's population. And um, I have some rice in front of me, if I can show you rice, a plate of rice with uh, uh, fish and uh, some vegetables. And this is the staple sort of diet of many people in Asia, especially people from Bangladesh. This is the typical uh, food that they would eat. And you have here a fish called Hilsha fish, which is the national fish of Bangladesh. And then you have some vegetables here. And then you have two different types of rice. One rice is sticky rice called Biron chal or Biron rice, which is a sticky glutinous rice. And then you have uh, the smallest rice in the world, which is called Kalizira, which is the smallest rice that you have uh, available according to most people. So this is a typical sort of diet of uh, the Bangladeshi people, uh, uh, rice and fish. And uh, this is something that is quite uh, common for the Bangladeshi people who also live in the UK. And of course, also for many people from Asia and rice as a, a cereal is becoming more and more popular across population in the Western world. And indeed, this is the, you know, the most fastest growing uh, cereal in terms of uh, tastes in new continents and other continents, I mean, uh, such as in Africa and such as in Latin America and so on. So rice is uh, becoming very, very popular around the world. So today's uh, lecture is about food safety related to rice. So this is uh, the discussion we are going to have. And um, I will show you, you know, uh, some uh, work that we have done and some work that others have done in order to sort of highlight what are the risks and how to minimize the risks. And then we'll have a chance to have questions and answer session at the end, so that if there is anything that is not clear and anything that needs more elaboration or uh, clarification, then there would be a chance to ask questions and answers uh, at the end. So um, I will now start the presentation by um, discussing about what are the main uh, sort of issues that one should consider when uh, considering safety issue with respect to rice. And at the beginning of this uh, slide, you can see I have on here on the right hand side arsenic on your plate. And this is actually one study that we did uh, some years ago with my uh, PhD student, uh, Claudia Cascio. And uh, this is uh, in the front page of a journal called Journal of Environmental Monitoring. And we have a picture showing rice and fish as I showed you just before, and uh, we have some pictures of arsenic in the rice because rice has high levels of arsenic compared to other types of cereals that uh, many people eat around the world. So we're going to discuss about arsenic and other sources of uh, you know, uh, concerns regarding eating rice, what are the safety issues, and how to reduce the risks. And so today's presentation will be a glimpse into this subject. It cannot cover everything in detail, but we will try and do as much as we can in order to, you know, sort of raise uh, safety issues. Because I mean, eating a, a safe food is paramount to having a, um, you know, a good health, uh, good life, and therefore we need to uh, get to know what we are eating and what they contain. And unfortunately, rice uh, is one of those uh, staple diets where we do have a lot of knowledge, but often we do not have. Uh, that knowledge being transmitted to the public so that they can make informed decision about the safety of the rice and so on. So, for example, we, you know, there is not, uh, there is no rules that tells us to label, uh, you know, um, packages of rice and stating how much arsenic the rice contains. For example, uh, there is no uh, rules related to that. So we cannot, you know, sort of decide which rice to buy in the marketplace based on the ingredients because it doesn't tell you how much arsenic there is or how much of other, you know, how much cadmium there is or how much lead there is. So we are in the dark related to how much of these elements are in those, uh, you know, rice that we are buying from the shops. And that is a, is a problem because we are going more and more into labeling things and providing enough information to the public so that they can make a informed decision as to whether they want to eat a that rice or if they should eat small amounts and reduce their exposure you know some people eat a lot of rice and therefore you know they are at greater risk and some people eat a very small amount of rice maybe once a week at most maybe for those people maybe it's not so important 
to know how much arsenic there is. But if someone is eating rice every day or every other day and they're eating lots of rice, huge amounts of it, then obviously, you know, a small amount of a toxic substance will then slowly accumulate in the body and therefore on the long term, there might be some harmful effects for those people who eat a lot of rice. And certain ethnic groups, certain population groups eat a lot of rice. So for example, in the UK, uh, Asians, especially those from Bangladesh, and especially those from you know, uh, China or Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, people from those regions actually eat a lot of rice. And so therefore knowing how much of heavy metals or pesticides or other toxins that might be present in rice is so important for them because uh, they're eating so much of this uh, cereal uh, over a long time this could have harmful effects on human health we do have knowledge that you know uh, chemicals of certain types will have impacts on our body uh, small quantities may be harmless and maybe even beneficial sometimes but you know taking huge amounts of it on a daily basis might have implications that are uh, not good for us. So we really need to have more knowledge and more information so that we can use science and use a knowledge-based approach to our diet and our lifestyle. So if you do want to ignore the rules and regulations, we want to ignore the safety issues, and then we are taking the risk upon ourselves. That is one's own personal choice. But we should be giving the people a choice to know what is in there so that they, if they wish to you know, maintain good health and reduce their exposure to toxic substances, then at least they can look at things and say, okay, I'm not going to eat this variety of rice. I will eat that variety of rice or I will reduce my intake of rice so that I'm reducing my exposure to toxins. And so this is an important issue that needs to be debated and discussed for a healthier future for all of humanity. And uh, ill health has a cost for even those who are healthy. As we know, what has happened during the COVID-19 crisis, you know, a lot of people perhaps were unaware about the need to be, um, the need to wear a mask, need to keep social distancing. And, you know, they decided not to maintain social distancing. They decided not to wear masks and they were uh, mixing around uh, with others in large groups and crowds. And as a consequence, we know the consequence of that has been that there are COVID-19 spread across our communities and a lot of people died. Those people who took care became victims of those people who did not take care. Furthermore, our hospitals got, the NHS did a tremendous job treating uh, patients who've been suffering from COVID-19. So of course, those people who are careless about taking care of themselves ended up creating difficulties for the NHS, creating difficulties for the NHS staff. So our actions has impacts not only on our own health, but indeed, you know, the health of others and also, you know, in terms of uh, economic costs and in terms of uh, space being occupied in hospitals and so on. So I think uh, it has to be done in a way such that people are given the knowledge, uh, they explain what the importance of healthy diet is, they know things about, you know, toxic substances and so on and how to reduce their exposure so we can develop a pre prevention is better than a cure strategy so that we can actually take care of our health. And on the long run, everyone will be happier. Everyone will be a winner. The people who are maintaining good health, they will be happier. Uh, the society will be happier. Uh, businesses and everyone will be happy. A healthy society is a win-win situation for everyone. And so therefore, learning from science and applying science to improve our lives is such an important issue that I cannot sort of like overemphasize. This is an important to uh, thing to consider. And uh, luckily, we have research being done. You know, we are here at De Montfort University, for example, doing a huge amount of research despite the lockdown, despite COVID-19. We are trying to work to find out uh, how we can improve human health, how we can reduce our exposure to toxic substances. We are learning things all the time. And through this knowledge that we can inform the public and inform uh, ourselves also that what is good and what is bad, what should we eat uh, less of and what should we eat more of. So all of these things are issues that uh, we should consider in our daily lives. I began my presentation with acknowledgements. The reason for that is that, you know, one's life, you know, I'm a professor now, but I became a professor through the help of many people. Uh, my parents, uh, uh, first and foremost, my you know, family, my children, all of the people around me helped, my teachers, my colleagues. And one of the most important person I would like to acknowledge who has been instrumental uh, in developing me as a scientist is Professor Dennis Chapman. As you can see his picture here in London, I worked with him as a PhD student. And here he is 
with Prince Charles, as you can see, him, uh, he's explaining the structure of a lipid molecule, a phospholipid molecule. He's showing how, uh, what is the structure of that to Prince Charles, showing the structure of a liposome. So Dennis was an instrumental person in my life. Uh, he developed me as a scientist, and I'm always grateful to him because he explained uh, the importance of, you know, looking at uh, problems from a multidimensional perspective rather than looking at in a very narrow sort of like um, very discipline based and very confined to one specific technique or specific methodology. He said, you know, you should look out for different angles to understand a particular subject. And I think one of the interesting uh, examples that we know from history is this uh, story of the, you know, the blind man and the elephant. And as you can see, uh, this is the old story. And this is a poem from John uh, Godfrey Sachs, who, who said, and so these men of Hindustan disputed long, loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. And I think this, this particular uh, you know, elephant story you know, explains to us very well the need to look at any particular problem from different angles, from different aspects. So I'm a strong believer in interdisciplinary research, looking at uh, any particular field from arts and humanities to history and science and, and all the different areas of science so that we can get a better picture of a particular system. I believe in holistic approach to understanding uh, what is happening around us, what is going into our own bodies, what is happening in the environment. In this way, I think we can understand things better. Of course, we can never be experts in all the different disciplines of knowledge. So therefore we need others. And that is the important thing and beauty of uh, scientific research is that in the past, people might have had their own little lab where they would make the discovery all on their own. Things have changed now. No one individual or no one lab or no one university or no one country can you know, have expertise in all the different disciplines at the highest level. And so therefore we need each other. As human beings, we need each other. As you know, people who inhabit this planet, we need each other. We need to cooperate with each other. We need to uh, you know, solve problems through cooperation, collaboration, and coordination so that uh, we advance science more rapidly, uh, more uh, successfully, and more comprehensively. In this way, we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, achieve things much faster. And I think, you know, example of the vaccine development recently is a good case where there has been greater international cooperation between uh, different countries. And I think, you know, there is some advances in this area. I think more needs to be done to be more open and to be more cooperative, so that we place uh, human lives. Uh, as being the most important thing that we should consider. Uh, uh, lives before profit, really, I think is very important. We should consider how we can help each other. You know, health and wealth, both of these things go together. We need to consider, uh, you know, wealth creation. Businesses, uh, you know, are important for em uh, employing people and, uh, and, and so on. So we need to have a balance. We need to work together so that everyone is a winner. Business people uh, make money. The public use their products and, you know, improve their health. So there is a... Uh, you know, good, uh, harmonious relationship between everyone in society, irrespective of, uh, you know, what area they're from, whether they're in business, in science, whether they're consumer or they're producers. So, so this is the, the beginning uh, of my story in the sense that my research and scientific uh, development has been shaped by this man, Danny Chapman. And I wrote his obituary after he passed away in 1999. I produced an obituary. And this you can actually find in this uh, journal called Trends in Biochemical Sciences. So now I'm going to discussing about um, uh, the subject to our safety of food. And of course, foods contain many, many different substances. And a famous saying that I think of uh, Paracelsus uh, is not worthy here because he said something very important. And I think uh, this is he's from 1493 to 1541. Uh, but he said something so profound. And I think this is so important today as it was in the past. And it will be important even in the future. And the thing he said is that all substances are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiates the poison. So it's all about, you know, certain substances, very small quantities. So it's a relative term as well. So some, some substances are very small amounts are toxic. Others, you need a lot of to become toxic. But it is the quantity that makes something to be a poison or not a poison. So this is something that you can look into if you are interested. You can uh, read and find out, find out about Paracelsus and his concept. Because this concept is so, so important because with rice, as you will see, some people are consuming very small amount of rice, maybe once a month or once a week. For these people, uh, you know, rice is not going to be a poison. 
But for those people who are is, uh, is, uh, eating rice three times a day, and they're eating plates full as this, as you can see in front of me, plates full as this three times a day or two times a day, because some people have breakfast in the, in the morning with rice, lunch also with rice, and evening meal also with rice. So for those people who are eating such huge quantities of rice on a daily basis, they have some cause for concern because if there are substances in rice that are somehow harmful, such as toxins, uh, toxic chemicals like arsenic and cadmium, they could have adverse effect on the long run. Furthermore, eating high quantities of rice has been linked with development of diabetes because there is an uh, easily accessible uh, sugar that comes from rice and that increases the sugar level of uh, uh, blood level of sugar, uh, sugar level in blood rises and it has effects on our pancreas and therefore development of type two diabetes has been linked with high consumption of rice, not small quantities, but those people who consume high quantities of white rice. This is the important point, the white rice. Uh, it is uh, been reported from uh, meta-analysis of the literature that there is a link with development of diabetes. So there is a, a dose uh, issue here that one has to keep in mind before everyone starts worrying that I should stop eating rice. I eat rice myself, as a matter of fact, every day. I'm a rice consumer because uh, I grew up eating rice. I'm originally from Bangladesh where rice is the, you know, the staple diet. And so I eat rice uh, every day, actually. I mean, hardly any day passes by without me not eating rice. So rice is something that is part of our uh, you know, heritage in this as as human beings in this world is been consumed for about eight thousand years, and it's uh, it's consumed by the half the world's population. So uh, do not get an idea that I'm presenting this lecture to say to anyone that don't eat rice or rice is poisonous. Far from it. Rice is a nutritious cereal, and uh, it should be part of a balanced diet. And this is what I will be discussing in my in my presentation. So everything is about dose, whatever it might be. It's the, it's, it's, you know, there is a saying that everything in moderation, you know, is when you go into excesses, that's where the problem rises. And, and I think the important thing is to inform the uh, public, inform ourselves about, you know, what levels might be toxic and how you can reduce your level of toxicity. So the prevention strategy should start at the very young age from uh, you know, school age and uh, from uh, uh, children in school so that we know through the whole life course how we can reduce our exposure as we go, as we grow, as we grow old, because our exposure types and sources will change as we grow. So a baby will have a source of exposure because of the type of food a baby can consume. And then someone in their midlife will consume a whole host of different foods and they will have other issues to uh, consider and think about. So it all depends on, on, your, uh, on your age, on your uh, environment, what is accessible to you, uh, your culture, where you grew up. You know, the people who eat rice, it's not necessarily because they love the taste of rice. It's because uh, they grew up eating rice and that became part of their traditional culture it became part of their habit and so it becomes so difficult for them to abandon this because for many culture uh, eating food is synonymous with rice so you know in bengali for example uh, in bangladeshi and bengali language people say when they talk about eating food they say bath hawa which means eating rice so that it is you know so someone says have you eaten they say have you uh, eaten rice that's what it is uh, and not only in bengali in many other languages in japanese in in chinese and other languages rice is synonymous with eating so it's such an important uh, thing for a lot of people we need to find ways to ensure that the rice that we eat is safe that we have a balanced diet and uh, far from saying that rice is something we must abandon i say rice is something that is worthy of eating but in moderation. So the food safety issue, this is a, this is a sort of slide which summarizes uh, the principles of food safety. I don't want to go into this de in detail, but there is a reference there, which you can go into and look into if you want to. There is food safety, which is about the protection principle to ensure the food is safe to eat, free from naturally occurring infectious and toxic contaminants. So this is the, this is the thing. So you want rice, that is safe to eat. It's free from naturally occurring infectious bacteria, um, fungus, and things like that. Toxic contaminants like lead, mercury, arsenic, and so on. So this is something that we want to have. And then the contaminants are a limited number of known pathogens uh, and contaminants such as heavy metals that can cause uh, foodborne illness. And causes and motivations are 
naturally occurring. A lot of the time, arsenic comes from the environment because of the high levels of arsenic in the soil. Sometimes it occurs because of industrial pollution and sometimes because of accidents and so on. And to protect the public, there is legislation. Here you have the uh, European Union, uh, the UK you know, uh, organizations such as the Food Safety, Food Safety Authority and so on. So these organizations uh, place legislations and rules to limit the amount of certain toxins that can be present in, in foods. And so the public are protected by, uh, by the government uh, through the legisla legislative procedures so that we are protected from harmful impacts. And as knowledge improves, you know, uh, things changes. And uh, arsenic is something that became a cause for concern because of scientific research. We never knew uh, about arsenic uh, in rice maybe, you know, 100 years ago. And people never thought of that as an issue. But because of advances in science, we realized that, you know, arsenic is coming from rice. And for some people, it's a big issue because arsenic is coming from rice by eating rice, but they're also getting arsenic from three, four, five other areas, such as, for example, maybe eating foods that are also rich in arsenic, such as seaweed, hijiki, that could be giving them more uh, arsenic. Then they might be drinking water from an area which is contaminated with arsenic. So another source of arsenic is coming into their body. And maybe they are doing some jobs which also exposes them to arsenic. And they're eating a lot of vegetables grown on contaminated soil. So sometimes people are not aware of the fact that, that they may be getting the same toxin from multiple sources. And that's something I think is quite complicated. And that is why it's not one size fits all. Everyone is different. Someone eating a small amount of rice can still be in danger because they may be getting a lot of arsenic from other sources. And so that little bit of rice, you know, contributes to making the uh, exposure even higher. So we need to look into individual diet and people need to know about their diet so that they can adjust, modify their habits so that they can protect themselves. And I think diversity is the important issue. But if the diverse products that they eat are also equally contaminated with arsenic, just so happens by some fluke, that they, you know, they have a very diverse diet, but those things that they uh, have chosen were all rich in arsenic. That can happen because maybe the fields from where the uh, vegetables and other products were cultivated were arsenic contaminated. So sometimes, you know, even that may not help. So it's not just simply, uh, you know, diversify your diet, but it's also an issue of also knowing if these diverse products have low arsenic or not, or low pesticides or not, or low cadmium and lead or not. So I think, I think knowledge and scientific advances are so critical for ensuring uh, good health of uh, people. More research needs to be done so that every individual can know how much arsenic they're getting into their body. We know we live in the age of big data. We have apps and uh, tools to do things for us. Uh, it's not something that is beyond uh, you know, sort of uh, human ability to develop tools and technologies at the individualized level, personal level, so everyone can know how much arsenic they're getting in. And if they realize, my God, I'm getting so much arsenic from eating huge amount of rice, I better cut down on rice and increase my intake of wheat. So these knowledge-based approaches can help society. And I think we should do more work on that to protect human health so that people can live sort of uh, a more healthier uh, life and uh, not suffer from ill health, which has a big burden on society. Currently, for example, you know, my mother is suffering from progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a debilitating uh, you know, uh, disease. Uh, there's no cure for it, and there is no medication for it. Scientific research will hopefully you know, find solutions to this, but you can see that her illness has an impact on all her family. So we've got to realize that you know, we cannot afford to make our population fall ill because it's not the individual only, the effect on the individual has an impact on whole of society. Individu individuals don't live in a vacuum. We live a, in a society and our, our uh, health, good health, bad health, all of these things will have an impact on others. So concerns regarding arsenic in rice has been something that has been going on for some time. We've, we've seen this in the media. So many newspapers have discussed about this. If you go and search in the internet, you'll find a huge volume of information about arsenic in rice because of the fact that people have measured arsenic in rice. We've done that ourselves. And we also uh, measure arsenic in humans uh, who consume a lot of rice. And it is a cause for uh, concern, but it has to be looked at in a, in a knowledgeable way, meaning that you know, one has to think about uh, how much rice one is eating. 
or what type of rice one is eating and what other sources of arsenic are they getting into their body. All of this integrated approach is necessary. And sometimes because people don't have the full knowledge, it becomes quite scary for people. People become very worried. Oh my God, I should stop eating rice. I mean, this, for example, is uh, you know sort of misleading for people. And we need to, as scientists, we need to explain the things that context is important. The dose is important. It's not necessarily just the product itself. It's how much one is taking of that particular product. And as I've been saying all the way through this presentation, rice uh, is something that is an important cereal uh, that has for long been uh, uh, an important player in the lives of humans through ages for about 8,000 years. Rice is considered the least allergenic cereal. So a lot of people for celiac disease, for example, people with uh, celiac disease, they would eat rice because uh, it does not have uh, gluten. Uh, rice is suitable for all age groups. It's the most favored weaning food for babies rice is the most favored winning food. So you can see if rice contains harmful substances, our little kids whose body size is small, so a, a spoonful of uh, uh, you know, a, a rice for an adult with a bigger body size will have lesser effect than a spoonful of rice for a small body size baby. So we have to take care of our children because they're our future. The future of humanity is actually our children. So you know there has been some focus on uh, rice and its impact on children. And I think that is important because we need to protect the children. And the European Food Standards Agency, uh, as well as the uh, international organizations such as uh, the World Health Organization, uh, uh, the FDA in the USA have actually you know, uh, focused on protecting uh, children uh, by ensuring that there are certain rules related to the maximum amount of arsenic you can have in a food, a rice that is used for baby foods. And I think this is very important because uh, the children are our future and we've got to protect them. Uh, rice is the highest calorific uh, density compared to, for example, wheat and maize. Uh, rice has the highest digestive energy. It has got a lot of different uh, properties that makes it unique. Uh, rice is gluten-free. Free. Three billion people, half the world's population, depend on rice for survival. And, you know, in countries such as Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Myanmar, you know, people, 70% uh, 70, 70 of calories actually are derived from rice. So rice is such an important crop. And... No wonder uh, it has been around for so long, 8,000 years. No wonder people continue to enjoy it. And no wonder uh, its popularity is increasing, not decreasing, even though there is worries about arsenic. So if something is good, people will always keep it. But what you need to do is ensure that people have the right knowledge and the rice is safe in terms of uh, contents of different chemicals so that it doesn't end up harming people. So. Rice is a nutritious cereal with many health benefits. And actually, I've taken this graph to show that there was a study which analyzed the number of phytochemicals. So these are plant-based chemicals, which generally tend to be considered to be good. Do not forget, just because something is natural does not make it uh, good per se, uh, because this is a miscon misconception in a way, because cholesterol, for example, uh, is a very important uh, molecule. As a matter of fact, my PhD supervisor, I, I worked with him on cholesterol. We looked at how cholesterol is important for the fluidity of our cell membrane. So cholesterol is important for normal body function, but if you have too much of cholesterol, it's a natural occurring uh, substance. If you have too much of that, you're gonna have atherosclerosis, you're gonna have disease, heart disease and so on. So it's not necessarily the, uh, the point that it's the, uh, you know, there is, it's natural and it's phytochemical, it's, it's plant-based, therefore everything is good. It's all about dose, quantity, and so on. So if you are getting the same phytochemical from 10 different sources, then its concentration in your body is going to be high. So if you're getting cholesterol, naturally occurring molecule, from you know, lots of different foods by, that happens to be very cholesterol rich, and you, without knowing, are eating a lot of that, then obviously your exposure to cholesterol is going to be very high and you're going to be affected. But cholesterol per se is not a bad substance. It is a naturally occurring substance, but intake in high quantities can be harmful. Same with sugar, same with salt. It's, it's the quantity that makes something a poison as I started my presentation with. And we need to know this. So information can be provided to people so that they can make the right judgment for their health and the right decision for their health. We have a lot of apps for um, for, for example, uh, apps for uh, how much exercise we should do, which food we should eat in terms of calorie content to reduce our uh, diet. But what we really need, and this is something I'm saying to all those who are listening to this presentation uh, from, uh, from here in the UK and around the world, what we really need to do is we need to produce an app that will tell people 
what chemicals they're getting exposed to, how much of it, and if there is a sort of like convergence of one or two or three or few different types of chemicals at high concentrations coming into an individual, then that can become a cause for concern and a, you know, alarm bell should ring telling the person, look, you're getting arsenic from 10 different sources. Reduce your intake of rice or uh, uh, substitute rice with something else or don't eat this food, eat that food. So the person can then adjust his diet or her diet to ensure that they don't get exposed to toxic substances, whether it is from food, whether from occupation, whether their lifestyle, whether from the environment. And if we uh, develop such an individualized tool that everyone can use, then we actually empower the people to look after themselves. Then our, uh, then our NHS and our hospitals will only need to cure the most sick who are really, really needy because there is no other option because we reduce the number of patients in our hospitals. And that is a good thing for all countries and all societies. And it's also important for the individual lives and families. No family wants to have, as I know, with my case of my own mother, uh, no, no one wants to have ill family members themselves being ill or even their relatives being ill or friends being ill because it actually has a severe impact on the health of the, the healthy people. So we need to do things in a way such that we can actually empower the people and make it individualized, personalized medicine, personalized diet, personalized health healthcare. So people themselves uh, through their own initiatives take care of their diet and, and so on and therefore reduce harmful exposures, whether from the environment, from food or occupation and so on. So this tool is necessary. And I'm saying this live that we need to produce this. And if anyone is interested with this expertise, do get in touch with me because I think we need to do this. Next uh, is a slide from uh, uh, shows the Japanese sort of like, you know, the food table or food guide. The reason I'm showing this actually is for those who might be think uh, rice is such a bad thing. The reason I'm putting this in here is that I, I've been fortunate enough to go to Japan and I've seen their diet. And it is actually one of the most um, unique countries in the world. If you, anyone asks me which is the most unique country in the world, I would say Japan. I've never been to any other country where the people are so different and their you know, organization is so different compared to any other country. And I've managed to travel to countries in Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, and so on. I found it very interesting. And uh, you know, it's a country which uh, loves rice. And that is something which I think is important to point out that rice forms the staple of the Japanese population. They have a very strong connection with rice, very cultural connections with rice. And by the way, Japanese people live the longest in the world they have, in terms of ranking, they live the longest. So I'm not saying this is due to rice, but if rice was so terrible and rice consumption in Japan is quite high, much higher than in the UK or in the Western world, if rice was such a bad cereal, then they will not be living as long as they do. Uh, Okinawa, the island of Okinawa, where rice is consumed, uh, it has the most centena centenarians, people living 100 plus than any other country in the world. So you can see rice uh, is good, but the other point to keep in mind about the Japanese diet, and I think that is the important point, is that they have a very mixed and varied diet. And that is the point I think that makes the situation different. Although they're eating a, you know, moderate quantities of rice, it's not huge quantities like they do consume in countries like Bangladesh or in Myanmar, but they have varied uh, you know, products in their diet, vegetables and fish. All of these things contribute to uh, their uh, good, uh, long, healthy life. So, so this is another point to stress that uh, the example of Japan I've given here is because it is unique. And even Hong Kong is another example because there also people live very long lives and rice is also the staple of the people in Hong Kong. So rice is a, a good cereal and uh, do not feel uh, worried about eating rice. But I think we need to know more about sources of uh, rice uh, you know, do they contain toxic substances or not? And how much am I eating so that you can make a knowledge-based scientific approach to your eating? And you see in the Japanese food guide, the most important thing they have at the top is physical activity. So it's all of this combination of things. It's a well-balanced diet, plenty of fluids and teas along with physical activity. No wonder that the Japanese live the longest. And I think from my own experience of being in Japan, uh, I can say that all of these things does, uh, you know, there is a scientific, you know, sort of uh, sense to what is happening there. And I think there is a lot that you can learn from them. So this is our, the E12 guide here in, uh, for our UK population. This is from uh, here in the UK. And as you can see, it's, uh, it, it, 
you know, uh, the, it, it's a varied diet. Rice isn't a big uh, part of uh, the UK diet, but there are certain population in the UK, ethnic groups, communities who consume a lot of rice. But the balanced diet is important, and this is what this Eat Well Guide is telling us. And there is, of course, more research needed to produce the best Eat Well Guide. And, and, as, and I strongly believe, as I said before, one size does not fit all. Everyone is different. Everyone's uh, food requirements are different. Everyone's body is different. The genetics is different. That is why we must go for a personalized, individualized Eat Well Guide so that everyone has their own Eat Well Guide uh, with them through their life course. It changes with time. What I, I might have been eating when I was a teenager will be different to what I will be eating when I'm sort of like now in my you know, 50s. So it's important to sort of like make things more personalized, use scientific approaches using big data, computers, and you know, all the technology we have to make our society more advanced in how we eat and control our eating. And at least we can then sort of uh, you know, have the knowledge to act or not act. If we are informed and if we're given the information thereafter, if we don't act, then you know, there is no one to blame. But if we do not do anything about providing the knowledge to people, then of course there is a cause for a concern. So unfortunately, not all diet are balanced. And, and for example, here people in Bangladesh consume as much as one kilogram of rice daily with very little access to protein rich foods such as, this is changing, Bangladesh is changing. Bangladesh is you know, uh, developing uh, rapidly. It's one of the top developing countries and a lot of changes are happening in Bangladesh. So some of the things that I've written here uh, actually is not going to be applicable for a lot of people because a lot of people are now eating a lot of fish, they're eating a lot of meat and now overconsumption is becoming an issue for certain sectors of the Bangladeshi community. Bangladesh is becoming a very wealthy country. This year it celebrates its 50th anniversary uh, 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 as an independent country and uh, lots of development has taken place there. Uh, however, balanced diet is lacking for some people. Those people who are poor eat a lot of rice and that actually exposes them to a greater risk of getting uh, substances that are toxic, for example, cadmium, lead and arsenic and therefore a more varied diet. In a way, the Bangladeshi diet is similar to Japanese diet because they eat a lot of fish, but the Japanese have a more varied diet and and they can afford to have a varied diet. But in Bangladesh, uh, not everyone can afford to have a you know, varied diet as a Japanese can. Otherwise, you know, uh, there would have been uh, much more improvements in the health of, of, uh, of a lot of people because there is a lot of problem with arsenic in certain sectors, not everywhere. In certain places where there is arsenic in the water, people are getting arsenic from rice and then getting arsenic from water and this together uh, creates ill health. Not only arsenic, other heavy metals, pesticides and so on. So there is a great need to look into the Bangladeshi diet and uh, maintain the traditional fish and rice makes a Bengali diet, but reduce the amount of rice and increase uh, other cereals perhaps and more vegetables. And in this way, the Bangladeshi diet can uh, be one of the best diet, just like the Japanese diet and other diets around the world, because it does have a lot of fish and vegetables uh, in its, uh, in its uh, daily you know, consumption pattern. So, so there is a need for a balanced diet. And I think not all countries have a balanced diet and I need to look into this. And even the Bangladeshi community in the UK, because our research is focused on the Bangladeshi community in the UK, uh, because this community has actually, from our research, we found that they consume the most rice compared to the other ethnic groups, whether it is uh, Indians or Pakistanis or uh, Chinese or uh, white Caucasians. And, you know, it's about 30 fold higher consumption compared to white Caucasians. And what we found, and this is, this is actually the work uh, that my former PhD student, Dr. Claudia Cascio did, and uh, she found that, you know, the Bangladesh is a much higher levels of arsenic in their urine. And this correlated very clearly with the amount of rice they were eating. So the more rice you eat, more arsenic you get into your body, and then it gets excreted into the urine and you can see there is exposure. And not all of it gets excreted. Some of it remains in the body and there lies the dangers of uh, toxicity. Bangladesh is on the other hand in the UK have the highest incidence of diabetes. And this may partially be due to the huge amount of rice that is being consumed. That has a contribution to uh, diabetes and all the other uh, cardiovascular diseases, carotid artery disease, and so on. So there is a great need also for the Bangladeshi community in the UK to change the habit of eating a lot of rice. And as I said before, it's about habit. The people of Bangladeshi uh, origin, their children grow up eating rice, just like I have done since I've been here from the age of 10. Rice has always been on my plate every day. And so it becomes a habit and you keep on eating the rice and you enjoy eating the rice. And sometimes, you know, it's so difficult. Like I showed you this plate, 
this plate here, as you can see, has this would be something that someone would eat for lunch. A uh, lot of rice, as you can see, rice dominates the plate. And even though they can have more fish and more vegetables, there is a certain ratio of rice to fish and vegetables that people like to make it optimal. So if there is too much uh, fish and too much rice, they won't like it because it's just that ratio that they got used to. So even though people can afford to have more vegetables, people can have afford to, afford to have more fish and meat, they will still eat a lot of rice uh, in terms of uh, you know amount compared to the amount of other foodstuffs because of just uh, you know people have got used to that way of eating. So there is a need to make the diet more balanced also for the population of the Bangladeshis in the UK. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Bangladeshi community was adversely affected by higher incidence of mortality and hospitalization. We do not know whether this is due to uh, you know uh, overcrowding in the houses or whether it is due to occupational exposure, whether it is due to their immune system being weakened by toxins from rice and other substances that these people have been eating. This is something that needs to be investigated and understood so that we can you know, improve the health of the population and, and especially prepare for future pandemics and future you know, uh, disease uh, scenarios that might arise in the future. There are some regulations, and I've taken this from the European Food Standards Agency article that was recently published. Uh, there are regulations that limit the presence of arsenic in food, and especially for young children, um, 100 micrograms per kilogram. This is, uh, uh, this should be, sorry, the previous slide is not uh, L, it's microgram. This should be microgram, 100 microgram per kilogram. Uh, that's the symbol that's been missing here. And, and, and the World Health Organization has also got some limits about the amount of inorganic arsenic. Inorganic arsenic is a toxic arsenic species. So this is the inorganic arsenic we are talking about because arsenic has different forms. Some are less toxic, some are more to toxic. And rice contains inorganic ar arsenic amongst other to uh, arsenic species. And the inorganic arsenic is the one that is toxic. And that is the one that we should be careful about and we want to reduce. And it's about 100 micrograms per kilogram maximum. Uh, it should not exceed that for, according to the EU Commission regulation for infant uh, food where rice is the ingredient. And, and, the, and in terms of polished rice, for example, uh, the uh, Cordex Alimentarius has adopted uh, through the years a regulation about 200 microgram per kilogram for polished rice. And polished rice is the rice that is most consumed. Here is the polished rice I can show you here. So polished rice is the normal white rice that we normally eat. And this is uh, the brown rice, if you can see here. This is brown rice. Brown rice is uh, something that some people favor because it is considered to be healthy uh, because it's whole grain. So, so what our research, as I said, revealed is the rice intake correlated to higher arsenic exposure. And this is, you can uh, read in the literature of our publications. I won't go into the details, but the main message to take from this slide is that there is more inorganic arsenic exposure in the Bangladeshi population compared to the other, uh, other groups. And that is a cause for concern because obviously uh, inorganic arsenic is a toxic substance and we want to limit, this, uh, limit its exposure. So we did not only look for problems, we wanted to find solutions as well, because I, I, I always believe in doing positive things. And one of the things we did was to look for rice that is lower in arsenic. And I think that's, uh, that is very important to do because, you know, you need to, uh, you cannot tell people stop eating rice, but what you can do is find ways of reducing their exposure to rice by finding uh, varieties of rice, you know, normal, uh, <coughs> naturally occurring varieties of rice, traditional rice varieties, or even, you know, genetically modified varieties that has uh, low uh, arsenic content and that is not harmful to human health. You got to look for technology-based approaches to finding rice that are low in arsenic. And uh, we found that aromatic rice from the Silet region of Bangladesh contains the lowest amount of arsenic and has high selenium content. So this was a region in Bangladesh. I think the reason why it has got low arsenic is because uh, there the people use rainwater and surface water for irrigating the rice crop. Rice crop has the highest amount of arsenic. And the reason for that is it grows in a very flooded environment. So, you know, you can imagine India, uh, you know, where rice grew for thousands of years uh, is the area where you have monsoon rain. So there is a lot of rain that comes through and, and rice is an ideal crop to, you know, cultivate in a very wet area. And, you know, Bangladesh being part of that, uh, you know, Indian subcontinent uh, is an area where there is a lot of uh, water and the people would grow that normally they would grow the rice in fl uh, flooded party fields with natural 
rainwater and uh, surface water from the ponds and the lakes. And therefore, the arsenic content is low. And Silet is one of those areas which is not so industrialized as compared to some other parts of Bangladesh. And therefore, the fields are less polluted and they're using rainwater and surface water and hence the rice arsenic content we found to be lower. But the interesting thing we did was also found that the rice content uh, in aromatic rice was actually quite low. So there are certain varieties of rice, aromatic rice. This rice, uh, aromatic rice is from Bangladesh, it's called Kalizira rice. Uh, it's, it's, it's the smallest rice in the world, and we found that it contains low levels of arsenic. So we can find uh, solutions to problem if you look and search for these things. So uh, now I like to sort of like come to the end of the presentation and quickly I will go through what are the food con uh, concerns regarding safety with respect to rice. First, we have this bacteria that can be present in rice. Bacillus cirrus is a bacteria. It's a spore forming bacteria. So the spores, even if the bacteria isn't there and there are some spores that remain in the rice, then they remain and survive. And even after cooking, so even high temperature cooking, these spores remain resistant to heat. And so what happens is that they can come back to life as it were. They can, you know, bacteria will grow out of them and then the whole rice will be polluted with bacteria. And there is fungi. There are different types of fungi which produce toxins, mycotoxins, which are also very harmful to human health. And then, of course, we talked about heavy metals, arsenic, cadmium, lead, these are also present in rice and then pesticides because pesticide is used not only for rice, but for everything. So there are some things that are specific to rice, heavy, you know, sort of uh, uh, in a flooded environment, lot of water and the water could be contaminated, arsenic and other things can get in. But other things are common, like with other uh, cereals, you know, you can get bacteria, you can get fungi and you can also get uh, uh, you can also get pesticides in your rice. So how do you reduce your exposure to pesticides from rice? It's not easy the major organizations are working to reduce pesticide levels in foods and in farming so that we use less pesticides to protect you know, human health and more work is being done in this area uh, but there are some suggestions as to how you can reduce your uh, reduce your exposure to pesticides and one of the suggestions that there is a link to the paper i'm giving here which you can go and look into they suggest that if you pre-soak the rice so before cooking the rice maybe overnight soaking the rice overnight getting the rice out putting it in the water overnight and then uh, you know getting rid of the water and washing the rice several times two three times and then uh, you know cooking the rice in extra water and then you uh, remove the water all of these things can actually reduce the amount of uh, pesticides that may remain. So this is one of the way. There are drawbacks to all of these things because you're going to use a lot more water. So water is going to be wasted, if you know what I mean, because water is a valuable resource. And the other thing is that, of course, you know, when you have excess water and you're cooking it and throwing away the water, a lot of nutrients can also go away with the, the water as well. So there are some uh, negative aspects to this. And then reducing your exposure to arsenic from rice. I think we need to find rice varieties that are low in arsenic. And our research has shown there are certain areas where rice grows well with low arsenic. And we need to find those areas and understand why you know, they grow with low arsenic and you have low arsenic in them so that we can actually improve uh, the amount of uh, rice that is produced with low arsenic. I think this is an area we need to do more work on. But meanwhile, people are suggesting uh, to cook rice in different ways. For example, cooking with excess water, washing it several times, discarding the excess water and so on. So there are different methods being suggested uh, which can help reduce the amount of arsenic in rice. But I think there is no substitute to finding ways where the levels of toxic metals, heavy metals and other things are naturally low in rice. So people don't have to waste a lot of water in the cooking process and a lot of energy in the cooking process. So having uh, cleaner rice, as it were, with less toxic substances is, I think, the way forward, rather than developing all these new methods that can get rid of arsenic, but they'll also get rid of some of the most important uh, sort of nutrients that might be present in the rice, reducing all those good beneficial substances that are needed by the body. So you are uh, you're throwing the bad away, but so you are throwing the good away. So it's throwing like the, 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 you know, the saying, throwing the baby with the bathwater, the saying, you know, it's similar to that. So we need to find better solutions. Reducing your exposure to mycotoxins from rice. So mycotoxins, if you see rice and other foods, they will often have mold on them, fungi. These are fungi. These produce mycotoxins. They can, you know, if, if you look at bread, often we have issues about bread and we see some mold. Should we eat it or not? The idea is no. Because this, even if there is uh, not spread through the whole bread, but they can, maybe we cannot see it with the naked eye. But if you look it under detailed uh, analysis using microscope and so on, then you will find that the mold has actually penetrated into the deep interior of the bread. And the so, same happens with rice. So you need to store the rice in dry environments so you reduce the growth of fungi. Water, 
is what allows living organisms to flourish. And so if the rice is dry, there is less chance of mold growing. Check rice for the presence of mold. And if there is something, if there is mold, fungi growing on them, throw, you, throw it away. If they look, you know, discolored, shriveled, something has gone wrong, I think it's, you've got to be careful not to use uh, rice that has got mold on them. And they can easily grow on damaged rice grains. So if in the processing of rice, in the production of rice, if there is a lot of damaged rice grains, there are more chance of having mold growing on them. And buy rice as fresh as possible. And that's not easy always for us here living in the UK, but it may be possible in certain parts of the world. And store the rice uh, properly, free from insects uh, in a dry area and not in a uh, warm and humid area. And do not keep rice for extended periods of time before being used, because these are all things that can harm you and in terms of uh, contamination with mycotoxins and so on. So there are some solutions to this. Apart from doing all of these practical steps, there is some research that has been done which showed that you can actually remove mycotoxins by uh, washing the rice and cooking in excess water and draining the uh, water so that you can reduce uh, aflatoxin, which is one of the mycotoxins present in rice. So there are ways that you can uh, you know, reduce uh, mycotoxins in rice. And then uh, this common problem we have here in the UK, often there is so many cases of people being food, uh, suffering from food poisoning because they've eaten a takeaway rice, uh, fried rice of them, and they suffer from diarrhea and vomiting. And this is a result of exposure to a bacterial toxin. And the bacteria I mentioned to you already is called Bacillus cereus. You can see it here. And the spore from this bacteria can survive, as I said, uh, even after cooking. And these toxins are what causes the food poisoning. So even though you think, oh, I boiled it and eaten it, if you leave your rice after cooking at room temperature for an extended period of time, then these spores, this rice provides an ideal environment for the spores to uh, you know, sort of grow into bacteria. So the number of bacteria will multiply and increase and increase. And by the time you eat and reheat the rice and eat it, you're exposing yourself to huge amount of bacteria. And that's going to give you diarrhea. That's going to give you vomiting and so on and food poisoning. So therefore, you know, Food Standards Agency, and I've got links from the NHS, which tells us, you know, how to store the rice carefully and safely. For example, if, you're, if you've cooked rice, uh, within an hour, you know, if you want to store it for later use, within an hour, rapidly cool it, spread it out on a surface, perhaps in a cool surface, cool it, and then put it in the fridge. And do not keep the rice in a fridge for more than one day. In those countries where people have been eating rice, they would eat, uh, they will produce rice every day. They will not, use, uh, generally, they don't tend to, most places, they don't tend to use, you know, old rice. They try, and, you know, most cultures have developed this approach of fresh rice every day. And therefore, there is less cases of this huge number of uh, people suffering from diarrhea and vomiting and so on. So when eating rice also, it's important that it is properly steamed all the way through so that it's not partially heated and partially, uh, you know, unheated. And, and do not he reheat rice more than once. These are advice that are well known. You can get them from the Food Standards Agency, from the NHS websites and so on. So conclusion of this presentation today is not a notorious cereal. That's a mistake there. <laughs> is a nutritious cereal okay so if anyone is looking at this and seeing this uh, the, it should be corrected to say rice is a nutritious cereal and it is fine to consume it as part of a varied and balanced diet yes it has developed a, a notorious uh, reputation recently but it is a not a notorious uh, uh, cereal but it is a nutritious cereal okay our research demonstrated that human exposure to arsenic from consumption of rice in the UK is, uh, is, is, is clear. And we studied with people in Bangladesh. We, show, we uh, demonstrated that uh, it increases exposure to arsenic and increases toxicity from arsenic. Uh, we've discovered varieties of rice from Bangladesh with low arsenic concentration that can help reduce exposure to arsenic. Uh, others have developed cooking methods to reduce arsenic content in cooked rice. Uh, we recommend people to eat. You know, this is the conclusion I want to give. The take-home message is rice is nutritious, nice is healthy. Rice is the staple diet of the Japanese population who live the longest in the world. We recommend people to eat a well-balanced diet for good nutrition and to diversify their diet in order to avoid potential harmful, harmful effects from consuming in excess of any one food. Uh, thank you very much all for listening to me. We will now have a chance to uh, have a question and answer session. So I really look forward to you know, uh, hearing your views and thoughts. And you can always contact me if there is not uh, enough time to discuss now. Please do uh, communicate with me by email. I'll be more than happy to engage in a discussion with you.
So now I'm just going to see um, uh, some uh, questions that have come through and I'm sort of like, uh, um, I'm going to go through some of the questions. You will not have time to answer all of them. So one of the question uh, that uh, comes is from Jamie, Jamie Newbold. Um, and his question is, uh, what is the main determinant of arsenic levels, cultivar or rice or environment uh, the rice is grown? Uh, this is a good question, uh, uh, Jamie. Uh, I think uh, there is no single answer to this because in certain environments, we find that because it contains uh, a lot of arsenic in the soil and also the irrigation water contains a lot of arsenic, we find that those uh, areas, even uh, irrespective of the cultivar, it seems that uh, the rice will uh, just soak up the arsenic. And, and therefore, there is, uh, you know, uh, clearly the rice is very efficient at taking up arsenic, transporting arsenic into the cereal. Uh, however, there are some uh, studies suggesting that certain varieties, for example, some studies indicate that aromatic rice, for example, seem to have low arsenic level compared to, uh, 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 you know, a non-aromatic variety. So, so there is still uh, uncertainty regarding what exactly is the main determinant, whether it is the environment, whether it is the cultivar. And I think more research is needed in this area to find a solution so that we can uh, promote those cultivars that are naturally good at uh, not soaking up arsenic. So, uh, so I think there is another question coming up, um, which I will. Um, so there, there is a question here. So there is a question here. Is it true that rice grown with the system of rice intensification method tends to be less contaminated? If so. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, uh, it, it depends on uh, systems of rice intensification method. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what uh, you are referring to here, but uh, certainly, you know, from uh, our experiences of what we have uh, seen in our studies ourselves, we found, we did a study, uh, um, you know, led by um, Queen's University Belfast, and we looked at rice from different regions of the world. We looked at rice from Africa, from Asia, from, from Europe, from North America, and we found that uh, some of the most, uh, you know, low containing arsenic, uh, low arsenic containing rice actually came from uh, the less polluted parts of the world. So for example, we found rice from Bali. I mean, I did mention already that rice from Bangladesh, from uh, Silet region actually contains low arsenic, but, uh, you know, rice from Bali was low in arsenic. We also found rice uh, in Malawi, uh, from Eastern part of Africa, where there is less uh, industrialization, there is less, uh, arsenic in the rice as well. So it seems like it depends on the environment in terms of the pollution, uh, in terms of usage of uh, fertilizers and pesticides. So there is a, it's a multifactorial issue. And then also the rice cultivar uh, and genetics and so on. So it's a combination of many factors that are playing a role. And I think more research needs to be done in order to identify what exactly is pivotal in uh, reducing arsenic uh, you know, uptake by rice plants. So uh, I think I, uh, I'm just looking to see if there is uh, another question. Uh, okay, so there is a question by uh, Petia Rainer, who says, uh, which, this question is an uh, interesting question. Um, is there any difference between white and brown rice? Uh, yes, there is a difference between white and brown rice. And uh, as much as there is difference between white uh, wheat and uh, white bread and uh, uh, white bread and brown bread. So if you look here, I've, I'm showing you uh, 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 brown rice. You can see here, as you can see, it's brown. And then it's white rice here. So one is polished and one is one is brown. What is the difference between them? Well, when you take the husk of the rice, the outer shell of the rice, then you are left with the brown rice. The brown rice is the brown layer. And brown layer, of course, contains lots of nutritious substances. And what has happened over the years because of development in technology and so on, people have become you know, brilliant art removing the bran. And therefore more and more people have started eating white rice. And, and this actually means that we are not getting the nutritious fiber and other minerals that are present in the bran layer. And I really think, this is my thinking, that the reason why white rice causes an increase in diabetes, where there is no correlation with brown rice, brown rice does not lead to an increase uh, in diabetes. My feeling is that the fact that when you remove the the brown layer, and you have the polished rice, the sugar levels and everything is easily digested. There is no fiber. There is a huge inflow of sugar into the blood. 
and you know when you are having huge amount of rice on a daily basis and you're getting huge loads of sugar going into your body this actually uh, ultimately over a long period of time is damaging to the body and leads to the development of diabetes whereas in the case of brown rice actually even if you're uh, eating rice brown rice you cannot eat as much i've i've done it myself you know when it's brown rice it become you become more uh, you know more easily filled up and you don't eat it as much and it's less sweet so sweet things is always something that people like a lot and so you know when you have polished rice you can eat a lot of rice because it's sweet and it gives you a desire to eat more and more and so i think what happens is that those people who eat polished rice polished rice from certain communities they eat a huge amount of white rice and they don't get all those important nutrients and they eat a lot of it and this leads to the development of diabetes in the case of the brown rice because of the fiber and the various minerals and they are, you are eating lesser amount of it overall is a uh, benefit has an uh, impacts a beneficial impact on health even in japan and other societies and in bangladesh and other countries where they eat a lot of rice rice was never eaten completely polished as it was as it is eaten now those days people used to do not have the technology to make it perfectly polished so there will always be some brown layer remaining it's partially brown not fully brown maybe but partially brown so it was more nutritious i still believe that brown rice is more nutritious than white polished rice so if someone asks me what rice they should eat i would i would say white uh, brown rice uh, and of course in moderation this is my uh, recommendation if there are no more questions uh, i would like to thank you all for taking part in this event i would like to uh, thank uh, all the uh, university staff who have organized this event for me uh, and it runs smoothly so far and uh, hopefully there will be opportunity for communication and interaction through email and other media to uh, further do research and further uh, improve our understanding and uh, once again thank you very much indeed for all your uh, comments and questions and thank you for joining the event today thank you bye bye